Uh, we're going to pick up the story in verse 10 today. We'll read verses 10 through 20. So let's stand as we read the word of God together. And as you stand, I just want to encourage you to bring your, I would like, you know, if many of you have Bibles and stuff, bring your Bibles because you guys, most of the time you read your Bible at home, right? And, and as we turn to different scriptures, I might have you turn to a different scripture rather than just looking at it. I've, I got it on a slide so you can watch it up there, but I also want you to kind of learn how to navigate your Bible. And so if you have a Bible, then when I say turn in your Bibles, you can turn in there. It helps you find out where it is, and you can start really learning the Word of God, and um, it'll help you to continue to grow as a believer. So Matthew 15, verse 10 says, When he had called the multitude to himself, he himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter answered and said to him, Explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. So let's pray. So Father, we do ask that you would bless us as we look into your word today. Your word is living and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it pierces to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints of the marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. Lord, work. We pray that your word would go forth today in um, the spirit and in power. To transform our lives. Even as we sang, from glory to glory to glory, Lord. We've tasted the glory. But we have more glory. We want more glory, Lord. So do that work in us. Open our eyes that we may see the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So today we're simply going to look at defilement, right? Um, two things about it, true defilement and the source of defilement. Um, I remember when I was a young child, I don't have very many memories. The first memory I have as a, as a child was when JFK was shot. I was two years old. In 1963, it was in my living room, and all I remember, I was I was in my little walker thing, and everybody was crying. Everybody was crying, and it was very impactful. And so I remember that even as a two-year-old, I had this scarred in my brain, this memory. But another memory I have is when I was in the first grade. Mrs. Thurman was my teacher. My best friend was a guy by the name of Jeff. I forget his last name. But uh, we used to play in the playground together. And in those days, girls had cooties, right? Remember that? And if girls touched you, you caught cooties. You were defiled. And so you didn't let the girls catch you because then you would be defiled. And, and we had a game, and the girls would chase us, and if they caught us, we would get cooties, and we would be defiled, whatever that meant. <laughs> but even as a... First grader, six years old, you know, as they caught me sometimes and, and I touched me. And then this one game was that they, they caught you, they, they kissed you on the cheek, right? It dawned on me 
that I didn't catch cooties. And so I remember even at six years old, looking forward to playing this cootie game and letting the cute ones catch me. <laughs> because it dawned on me that nothing happened. It wasn't, it wasn't so bad after all, you know. I didn't really get the cooties. I didn't get defiled. And that's kind of our story here. You know, these religious Jews thought that they were defiled. But Jesus comes on the scene, you know, and he kind of shakes them all up, to, as, as, we, as we'll see. So the first one, Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 12. Let's read that again. When he called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear and understand, not what goes into a mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came to him and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? And so verse 11 here, you know, Jesus makes this revolutionary statement that you're not going to be defiled by eating with unwashed hands. And, and you, if you weren't here last week, you should get the um, recording. You can get it on crossculturemarietta.com and listen to it, uh, talking about all of the traditions of the elders. And that's, that's what is going on here. So by, by eating with unwashed hand, the religious leaders or the Pharisees and the scribe believed that they would become defiled. And um, this word defiled, koinoo, means in classical Greek to make common. And in biblical use, it's to make Levitically or ceremonially unclean. In other words, if you eat with unwashed hands, you're going to get the cooties. That's kind of, you're going to be ceremonially defiled. You're going to be made unclean. And, and, the, and the disciples said, do you know that the Pharisees, when you said this, did you know that they were offended at what you said? Remember, it was the scribes and the Pharisees who, at the beginning of the story last week, came to Jesus, and they, then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders, for they do not wash their hands when they eat bread? And remember, we, we learned who the scribes were. The scribes were this group of men who took the 1,613 mitzvah in Hebrew or the 613 commandments of the Old Testament and they detailed how to implement them in your life. Like, for instance, you shall not work on the Sabbath day. What does it mean to work? And they would detail you, they would explain to you what that was in detail. They would say you could go so many steps, but if you take one more step, that's working. Um, you can't carry a burden. So if you have false teeth, you can't wear your false teeth on the Sabbath because that's carrying a burden. And, and so many minute details to explain every instance, every kind of application, everything that may happen in your life. They wanted to explain what it is that you had to do in order that you didn't break the law. And so these oral traditions, well, this is the traditions of the elders that Jesus is speaking about, that they're speaking about in this passage. All of these minute, minute details or what we would say maybe legalism. And the Pharisees, remember what we learned last week about the Pharisees, these guys were separatists. And so they were the ones that were living out in detail all that the scribes prescribed to them. So the scribes would figure out how to apply the law to your life, and then the Pharisees would make sure that they did it and they were fulfilling it. And so when Jesus said, that, you know, it's not what goes into a man's mouth. Right there, this offended, this shook the foundation of their life. Their whole life was wrapped up in these things. 
making sure that they didn't break the minute details of the, of the tradition of the fathers, remember. And so they say, hey, don't worry about it. And she, you know, it rocked them. It rocked these men. In verse 13, it says, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. <laughs> Whatever God has not planted will be uprooted. That is a big statement right there, right? And we're going to look at this a little bit in depth today. In our context, the thing that God has implanted is a reference to the tradition of the elders. That's what Jesus is saying. The, the traditions of the elders, that is not planted by God. And that's going to be uprooted. And what Jesus is doing in his ministry is he's uprooting the tradition of the elders. And that's why they have this great conflict with him. That's why at the end they want to put him to death, you know. Verse 3 again, he answered and said to them, Why do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? What Jesus is saying here, is that the Old Testament, the 16, 613 mitzvah, you know, that is God's commandment. That is of divine origin. That is not going to be uprooted. But your explanation of it, that's the thing that's going to be uprooted at the end of the day. The Old Testament law was planted by God and it was going to be established and not one jot or one tittle will ever disappear. Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus said, but my word shall never pass away. And so we need to understand the difference between the scriptures and then other writings, right? The Bible is the only book that is divinely inspired, and therefore, the Word of God. You understand that? The Bible, these 66 books in the Old and New Testament, is the only book that is divinely inspired by God, and therefore, the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good works. The only book that's inspired by God. I read a lot of other books. I read a lot of commentaries, right? Anybody know a couple of the commentaries that I read? What's an author? What? What? G. Campbell Morgan, Matthew Henry, William Barclay, I've quoted him, right? All of these men of God who wrote about the Word of God. But I understand the difference between what they wrote and God's Word. <laughs> they wrote, and in their writings is truth, it contains truth, but the difference is this. The word of God is truth. Human writers uh, that are not under divine inspiration, they can write, but it's tainted with our humanness. We're going to be fallible. We're going to get it wrong. The only ones that don't get it wrong are those who are under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who write the word of God, and I'm going to share a little bit about that in a moment. But just as what Jesus said. How many people here believe what Jesus said? <laughs> Sanctify them by your truth, talking about his disciples. And then he says, your word is truth. Your word is truth. 
What I'm going to say today about God's word contains truth. But you have to understand the difference. And you need to equip yourself with the truth of God's word so that you can discern if anything comes out of my mouth is not the truth. Good thing that I never make mistakes. Right, Jusha? Where's my wife? (laughs) You know, if I could listen to the sermons I preached you know, when I was a young minister at that home fellowship in 1987 with all of the Swedish girls there, if, I could, if they recorded those things, and I'm glad they didn't, and I listen to them now, I'm sure that I'd be like, oh my gosh, I said that. Because, I, you know, you grow and you learn and you develop your, your theology. And, and when you're younger, you, you're probably going to utter some things that aren't quite right. God will still use you. God still used me back in those days. It's not that you can't, but you you know you know what I mean. Man is fallible, but the Bible is without error. The Bible is the Word of God, right? God cannot err. God doesn't make mistakes. God is not like me. Therefore, the Bible cannot err. So the word that we have, the word of God, is without error. That's why the word of God is truth, and commentators are what I say contains truth. You know, and hopefully, you know, through these commentators and through the preaching of the word of God is more application and bringing it so that we today in our modern society can understand God's word better and apply it to our lives in our, in our culture. Hence the name cross-culture. Cross-culture Marietta, a never-changing cross. The truth never changes. The culture does. How are we going to apply the truth of God in our culture today? And our culture changes so rapidly today. The, the, the environment that I grew up when I was a teenager, is not the same as the environment the teenagers are growing up today. So we need to help them, generation after generation, help people learn how to live the truth in their their culture. Let me read a little bit more of a modern-day example of what was going on here with the tradition of the elders in in our text. For example, Mormonism. You ever heard of a man named Joseph Smith? Um, He kind of founded Mormonism. This is in his writings, The History of the Church. This is what he says. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth. And he's including the Bible in the statement. And the keystone of our religion. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. This is his claim about the Book of Mormon, which contradicts the Bible. Right? And in Mormon religion, the Book of Mormon supersedes the Word of God, the Bible. Just like the tradition of the elders began to supersede the Word of God, the explanation superseded the actual origin, the 613 mitzvah or commandments, right? We have to be careful. We have to be careful. So let me just explain a little bit. We did this a couple of weeks ago, but I want to give these seven things to the church in general today because how do we know? How do you know? How can I be confident that these 66 books are actually God's word. How do you know that they're God's word? What about the Apocrypha? What about the Book of Mormon? What about the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah Witnesses? How do we know that those are not? We claim that these are. They claim that those are. How, how do we know who is right? Well, there are principles that kind of governed the recognition 
of what is an inspired writing and what is not an inspired writing. And so, what is, what is it? The first one is a prophetic principle. Does the book claim to have divine authority? In other words, does it say, thus saith the Lord? The, you know, and does it declare that this is God's word? And not every book has all, all of these principles, but all of these principles will govern to be able to ascertain whether or not a book is truly inspired or not. You follow me so far? So the second one, the power principle, does it have a living conviction? You know how the word of God works in your life. When you read the Bible and when the preaching of the word, it's like God is speaking right to you. There's a power in the word of God. As I prayed in the prayer, the word of God is living and powerful. And when you are under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit or, or when there's a, a preacher that's preaching and, and maybe he's pr preaching prophetically right to you, you feel like you're the only one in the room. Right? That's God's word. There's a power to it. The people of God principle. Did the people of God recognize it as God's word? As the word of God? In other words, when the Old Testament was written or when it was spoken, did, did the people in the immediate context recognize that this is God's word? You know how we get the Old Testament? Because the people of God, the Jewish people, that's their old, that's their Bible. And we receive that from them. And I'll share some other, some other things in a moment. But, if, you know, with the New Testament, it was recognized to have, to be Scripture early on, right from the beginning. Even in the Bible, it's recognized to be Scripture. And then here's the big one right here. Past truth principle. Does this writing here that somebody's claiming to be from God or inspired God from by God, does it contradict what's already been recognized as God's word? In other words, do the New Testament books contradict the Old Testament? They don't. There's there's no contradictions. In God's word. They, they're seeming contradictions, but there are answers for those. And, and that's a big one, isn't it? When people say, well, I, I'm not a Christian because there's so many contradictions in, contradictions in God's word. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard that? Well, ask them, wh where is the contradiction? And they don't know. They've just heard this thing. And it was Adolf Hitler said, if you say a lie long enough, people will believe it. And if you can pound that into people, they'll start accepting that there are contradictions in the Bible. But you ask them, where is it? And they don't have it. Or if they do have one that seems to be a, a contradiction, then you can give the reason or the answer why it's not a contradiction. But when there's a direct contradiction of a supposed revelation of God with what's already been revealed, <laughs> one of them's wrong. Opposites both can't be true. I can't look like Brad Pitt and Jabba the Hutt at the same time. So obviously I look like Brad Pitt. That's the truth. Anybody that would say that I look like Jabba the Hutt, they, they're liars. And the truth is not in them. Pray for those poor souls. They're obviously blinded. You know, two contradictory statements cannot both be true. So if this book is God's word, and then I have an inspiration, or if I have this other document that I'm claiming to be God's word, but it contradicts a previous revelation of God, then that's wrong. And it's rejected. It's to be rejected. It's not God. It's not inspired by God. It may contain truth, but it is not the truth. Amen? The Petrine principle. Listen to what 
Peter says. In uh, 2 Peter 3.16, as also in all, uh, in talking about Paul's epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of Scripture. So what Paul is saying is that Peter's right, or what Peter is saying is that Paul's writings are Scripture. He's making that equivalent or whatever, however to say that. Just like all these other scriptures, Paul's scriptures are sometimes twisted as well. And then this is what Paul says. In 1 Timothy 5.18, For the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So this comes from two places. In Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, it says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. So Paul is looking back into the Old Testament, and he's bringing this verse into a modern application. But then he uses another one from Luke 10, verse 7. And remain, when Jesus said, Remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. And so he's making, uh, he's saying that this New Testament quote has the same scriptural authority as Deuteronomy, which is, by the way, part of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the most revered books in the Jewish tradition. Those, those are... Other places, we call them 1st Moses, 2nd Moses, 3rd Moses, 4th Moses, 5 Moses. They're not called Genesis, Exodus, etc. So, Paul is already recognizing the Gospels that were written as Scripture, as being Scripture. And then, one last one that my friend Joe Holden um, Dr. Joe Holden, he added this one, the providential principle, God will protect his word. And so these things help us to recognize and to know that this Bible that we have is really inspired by God. And it helps us to understand that these other documents that claim divine authority don't have it. They are not written by God. So, during the Reformation, we just had the 500th birthday of the Reformation a while back, right? Solo Scriptura was a rallying cry to return to the authority of God's Word. And I want to just read what the Gospel Coalition um, is on their website. For the Reformers, Sola Scriptura did not mean that the church and its official summaries of Scripture, like from the creeds, the confessions, the catechisms, and decisions in wider assemblies, had no authority. Rather, it meant that their ministerial authority was dependent entirely on the magisterial authority of Scripture. Scripture is the master, the church is the minister. You see, you know what they're saying there? Is that the church, even though we have our doctrinal statements and we even have cross-culture ministry, a statement of faith, the statement of faith is not the authority. The word of God is the authority. And if my statement of faith is wrong... You know, we need to be challenged and need to be willing to change the statement of faith, right? And it's not wrong because we went over it. So you can be secure in that. God's word is the authority. That's what Jesus is saying. Your traditions, your extra biblical writings, that's going to be uprooted. That's, that's, that's not planted by God. But the word of God, his word, that will remain. That's been planted by 
our Lord, by our God. So, the principle underlying this passage, I believe we can apply it in various ways. And the first way is, I think, the most applicable for us. And and it's just a simple question. What has God planted in your life? What are the things that you know God has planted in you? Because anything else, the implication is, will be uprooted. Whatever is not of God will, at some point, be uprooted in our life. We do a lot of things with our life. We spend our time doing many different things in our life. Many of the things I know that I do in my life absolutely mean, they mean absolutely nothing. For example, I watched the Chargers last night absolutely means nothing a bunch of losers now had they won it might have meant something not as true there's nothing simple about that but there's nothing eternal about it either is there what has god planted in our life has god planted in your have you opened your heart and let god plant in your life? Have you opened your heart and let him begin to plant his word in your heart to germinate and to take root so that it can produce fruit for him for his kingdom? That's the question. Hebrews. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews because this is a good passage. You can find it and then you can find it later on too. But if you don't have a Bible, by all means, I've brought mine for you. Verse 20. What? No, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 through 29. It says, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, yet once more indicates, um, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken. Listen to that. The removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Now listen to this. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And what that is saying is, is this world that we live in is passing away. Einstein proved it, the second law of thermodynamics, the Bible declares it, the Bible is true, it cannot cannot err, heaven and earth is going to pass away. It's coming to an end. And everything in it is coming to an end. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. But we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. The kingdom of God, when the destruction of this world, when the destruction of heaven comes, is going to remain. And if our lives are firmly planted in God's kingdom, we're going to remain. That cannot be uprooted. Amen? Where, where, where are your feet planted? Where is your life planted? What has God planted in your life? When we get to the end of our lives, and I'm a lot closer to the end of my life than I was back in that home fellowship in 1987. 1987, I was in my 20s. 
and I was going to live forever. You're invincible. You get into your 50s, closer to 60, you realize, well, you know, there is a, there's a, the end's in sight, you know. When you get to the end, you're on your deathbed. Will there be anything that's going to continue after you pass? Maybe, you know, maybe you'll survive and maybe you'll enter into heaven because of the grace of God. Amen. Praise God for his grace. But I don't just want to make it to heaven. I don't want to just get there. I want to impact. I want to leave a legacy. You know, I want to, my life at the end, I don't want to regret wasting my life worshiping the San Diego Chargers who lose every year. Charger fans, we our famous saying is, wait till next year, right? After last night, we're saying it again, wait till next year. It's empty. It's going to (laughs) end. The only thing worse is being a Raider fan. (laughs) Is your heart open to God? Have you said, have you opened your heart and said, God, plant in me? Plant in me your word that I might not sin against you. Lord, plant in me your word that my life means something. That at the end it's just not vapor off of a pot of water that appears and vanishes away. But I want my life to mean, I want my life to have substance. The only way you can do that, the only ha- way to have real substance, the only way to have something that cannot be uprooted are the things of God, people. It's the things of God. And if you've drifted from the things of God, come back. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Come to me. Open your heart. Come to him and say, plant, Lord, plant your word in my heart. I want to open my heart to receive your word. You might have heard the gospel time and time again, and you've shut yourself off to it. You've hardened yourself. As we learned about the parable of the sower, the four different soils of a man's heart, the hard soil. And the devil comes and snatches it away. The soil that is planted next to other things and it kind of gets intertwined and the world chokes it off. What's the other one? One more. Two more. But the, the final one is the good soil where it gets planted in a good heart and it grows. It wasn't in my notes. I was saying, you know, getting close to 60, you know what I mean? parable of the tares. We've already studied this. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You practice lawlessness, you know. You think about that. I don't know what this this not It's got lost in my notes here, but anyway. So that, that not only in your life, individually, but what about your ministry? You know, we serve Jesus. We love Jesus. You know, we become Christians. He he plants in us. We open our hearts, and then we have a ministry. We begin to serve him. Um, if we aren't, I want to encourage you to be open to serving him. 
So I'm lost in here. How do you go back? There it is. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is a truth for you. Not only are you believers, but God wants to use you. And God has works for you to do. He has things. So if you're not actively involved in serving in some way, then most of the things that you're doing in life are going to be uprooted. Right? If your things, the things that you're doing are not works given from God, then what value are they eternally? And I'm not saying like a lot of us work, we have a job that we do, right? And I know that God has opened the door for me to have a job. That's, and as I do my job, I do it as unto God. But I also have other things that I want to do. I want my, my time. I want to I offer my life as a living sacrifice for the service of God, to do something for him, your ministry that you might have. And secondly, if, if you are serving, are the things that you're doing, are you sure they're the things that God wants you to do? And this is when I was supposed to read that. But here are people that were serving. You know, they were prophesying. They were casting out demons. They were doing many wonders. But they never knew Jesus. Jesus never knew them. They were active doing things. But there was no connection. There was no revelation. There was no fellowship with Jesus. You know, you think about the example I used earlier of, of the family who are atheists going to the Lutheran church to have their daughter confirmed. It's meaningless. You know? Sure, they're doing something, but there, there's, there's no such, there's no reality to it. And so we need, we need to always search our, our hearts, you know, are the things that we're doing the right things, the things that God has for us. People think that just because they're busy in ministry, for example, that God must be okay with their lives. That's kind of what I see happening here. There was some things that were taking place, but these people were so far from God, they didn't even know him. For example, I know of people that have, because their ministry was growing and flourishing, that God said that everything was okay. But in reality, there was something really wrong. They were in sin. And then later on, later on it, it, came, it became exposed. You know? And just because God is, is blessing and, and people may be in your ministry, there's fruit, there's seeming fruit from it. Don't think it's because of you. It's not because of God's grace. God may be using you in spite of you. But are you right with God? Is your heart right with God? Are the things that you're doing, are you doing them with the right heart? If you're not, you shouldn't be doing them. If you can't do it from a right heart, you shouldn't do them at all. You know, it's, you know like this request for us to pray about moving off campus. That has caused me and some of the leaders to kind of really think about what we're going to do in the future and, and all of these kind of things. And it's kind of maybe, and others kind of thinking, are, are, are the things that we're doing from the Lord, you know? And I've come to the conclusion that, you know, their cross-culture Marietta exists because God wants it to exist. And we're, we're, we're meeting a need, you know. And there, there are various ways that we can grow in this church. We have Sunday morning service. 
We have a Wednesday service. And we have a home fellowship that Brian, Uncle Brian leads. These are opportunities for growth. We know the, the women are going to start meeting once or twice a month, and that's another opportunity for women to grow. We don't have a men's ministry. Yeah, we don't have one. It's not a way you can grow here, cross culture Marietta right now. It's just the way it is. We don't have a couple's ministry. But we don't have one. So what? That's not what we We don't have it. Uh, when God brings one, when God raises somebody up to do a men's ministry, when God raises somebody up to do a couple's ministry, then we'll have one. But until then, that's not, I'm not going to worry about what we don't have. I'm just going to worry about what we do have. You know? and this is what God has, has for us right now. And Wednesday night has been a blessing. I mean, if you don't come out on Wednesday nights, we invite you to come out. If you want to continue, if you want to grow, here's another opportunity for growth. You know, um, and, and it's been a blessing. We have a great time of fellowship. Uh, right now, we're going through our statement of faith, just um, so that everybody's on the on same page of what we believe. It's cr- cross culture, Marietta. And when we get done with that, we'll we'll play about you know what we'll do in the future. Maybe go through a book or Genesis. I don't know. A lot of thoughts going through my mind, but. Um, don't have anything from the Lord, and it's 1235. <laughs> Just looked up at the clock. Sorry, people. I could talk all day. <laughs> so, so you know, this is who we are, and, um, yeah, and we're just going to continue to do those things. And then just for cl- closing today, we'll finish this next week. Um, verse 11 these leaders are blind. They're blind. And the, a leader attempting to lead a blind person, a blind person attempting to lead a blind person. Mr. Magoo, for those of us that are older, <laughs> trying to lead somebody else that's blind. It's a recipe for disaster, right? It's an accident waiting to happen. And these guys were blind. Listen to what Jesus tell, tells them in Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, these same men that we're dealing with in this passage. You're hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. You're caught up with all these little things, making sure you, you abide by the rules, but you missed out on the, on the real issues of life, of justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others undone. Blind guides. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat and swallow a camel, and they actually would wear a netting to make sure while they were walking down the street that a gnat didn't fly in their mouth or in their nose because that would be an unclean, it wouldn't kosher, it's not kosher. And Jesus said, you you worry about all these little things, but you're eating a camel. The weightier matters, you're missing out, you know. And I don't want us to miss out, I don't want you to miss out. God wants to plant in your life things that cannot be uprooted. He wants to plant his word. He wants to plant the truth. He wants you to walk in truth. He wants you to live by the truth. So at the end of the day, at the end of your life, your life will have meant something. There will be something of substance. And it all won't be wasted. So the worship team can come back up. So Father... We ask, God, that you would guide us into the truth. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come, Lord, on, and rest on each one of us. And that he would lead us into the truth. And maybe as your word has gone forth today, you know, the truth has resonated in people's minds and people's hearts. 
maybe they've realized that, that they are not in the truth or they haven't been living by the truth. Maybe they realize that their, their lives at the end will all be uprooted. There won't be anything left. Lord, I pray that they just open their hearts to you. To really receive the truth, Lord. And to live by it. Not to be hearers of the word, only deceiving ourselves. But be doers of the word. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to do, to walk in truth. It's so difficult, Lord, to, to be consistent. We can't do it without you, so we ask that you would empower us and enable us, Lord, to live for you in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation that we can live for you and we can be a light it shines in the darkness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.